Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz bass player, improviser, composer, and teacher Mark Dresser. He was on his way to New York City from San Diego during our talk, and he talked about many things, like being raised in L.A., his latest record called Sentimental You, being a member of Anthony Braxton's quartet from 85 to 94, and the awards and adventures along the way. These days, he is a professor of music at the University of California, San Diego, so get to know more. Mark, and dig this interview, my friends. Hey, again, Mark, thank you for taking some time out. I appreciate it. I'm flying to New York in a couple hours. Good. I'm playing with uh, Jerry Grinelli and uh, Dave, Doug with Dave Douglas and Jane Ira Bloom. Wonderful. Well, that's kind of where I was leading to what's been going okay. on lately. So with the activity that's going on, and then I was going to segue into your latest al album, Sentimental You. So what, sure. what is going on? What's going on with you? Tomorrow night I'm playing at... Uh, at the Stone, this is John Zorn's club in New York City, and it's an artist feature of the great drummer Jerry Grinelli, and with his uh, this special quartet with uh, Dave Douglas on trumpet and Jane Ira Bloom on soprano sax and myself. So that'll be a you know that'll be wonderful. And then uh, on Saturday, I'm playing a solo concert in uh, Berkeley, California. Then I come home, and then Tuesday I play. <laughs> Uh, I'm playing on Jazz Live, uh, 88.3 FM in San Diego. It's a live broadcast of my quintet. And then, you know, the recording the, in the following weekend. So it's a, it's a busy period, fortunately. And, uh, and then I'm also teaching full-time at UC San Diego. I got a, a nice group of excellent bass players, some of them improvisers, and, uh, and uh, you know, teaching courses and, you know, look, I'm going to go on sabbatical in spring and hopefully we'll go to, uh, we'll be going to Europe to perform. The year looks good so far. Right on. You know, you've been at it for quite a while. You've traveled quite a bit. Do you still enjoy traveling and going around and performing? Well, I love performing. There's nothing I enjoy more than performing and traveling is just a part of it. I mean, traveling is not my favorite part of it, but, uh, uh, definitely going to play different places and uh, you know being able to share my music is a great privilege. I, I really am grateful for it. So, Sentimental You is your latest album. It's a great listen, and I just want you to kind of take me into the studio, take the listener into the sonic soundscape of this album. So, talk to me a little bit about it. First of all, I had a, a wonderful band uh, with David Morales Boroff on violin, the great Nicole Mitchell on flute. David's a young, 22 years old. He's a, just a gifted violinist. Uh, uh, Nicole Mitchell's celebrated uh, flute player, the great Marty Ehrlich on clarinet. Wonderful trombonist Michael Desson, and the also amazing Joshua White on piano, and I had a great Jim Black on drums. So, you know, with a band like that, it's really hard to, to miss. And so, like, uh, we recorded, you know, at a really nice studio in Los Angeles and with the great engineer, uh, Ron, Ron St. Germain, who's done many, many things. And, uh, for, you know, all, lots of fields, too. So it was what a, a luxury to have that kind of uh, uh, experience recording. We had two full days of recording in a beautiful studio with a top flight engineer. So. About the music itself, you know, was I wrote it, you know, it took, you know, uh, over a couple of years, but the, the last summer was really spent, uh, you know, arranging it and fleshing out certain things. So some of the tunes are tributes, like I have one dedicated to the great Roswell Rudd called Will Well, another one to, to uh, for my friend, the late, wonderful soprano, uh, Alexander Montano, and also an homage to uh, the late uh, Daniel Jackson, who's a local saxophone uh, hero in San Diego, uh, pianist, composer, and a uh, well-loved guy. So that's called Two Handfuls of Peace. And then I have a couple other tunes that are kind of humorously titled, but have, you know, were, were inspired by current events. Uh, one's called Hobby Lobby Horse, and then uh, one called Trumpin' Putin Stupin'. And then finally, uh, there's the, the title tune, Sentimental You, which I was basically kind of looking at the tune in a sentimental mood and tried to put all these musical agendas that I have really been interested in over the years 
isometric modulation, the use of timbre and sound color, and, and you know, mo- modulating not only written tempo, but also modulating harmony. At the same time, I'm always trying to feature and feature the, my, the soloists that I've chosen because really they're the, they're the ingredient that really makes the music special. So it's really kind of orchestrating not only the, the notated music, but orchestrating the improvisation and trying to find the right chemistry at the right time and, you know, the sequence of what, what event follows which improvisationally as well as compositionally. You know, I played your track, Trump, Putin, Stupin, on my show prior to the election, hoping for something a little bit different. So it seems the name of that track seems awfully strange these days with what's been swirling. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's funny. I, you know, you, you, you choose, uh, that title was obviously done way before the election. It's funny how things work out. Yeah, it is for sure. So, yeah. <laughs> the, under, the understatement of the day. Oh my God, are you kidding me? It's the elephant in the room. So let's yeah. go back. Let's go back to the beginnings of your life in Los Angeles. Talk to me about your childhood and how you got hooked on jazz. Well, I grew up in Los Angeles. I grew up, and my mom was an amateur musician. She actually taught folk guitar, and uh, we used to have hoot nannies at our house like weekly. This is where the people, my friends and my folks would get together with their guitars and have a book of songs that they would sing. And I would, you know, find myself at some point in the evening, you know, uh, making, um, playing bass for that. So that was sort of one of the first, you know, communal uh, performing things outside of, you know, playing in school orchestra. I've been playing the bass since I was 10 years old. And, uh, and growing up in L.A. is such a great town, but... It's so spread out, you rarely run into things. You know, you really have to know exactly what you were doing, or by chance, you get hooked up to things. So at one point, uh, when I was about 13, uh, I went to a concert at the Pilgrimage Bowl and heard the Paul Horn Quintet, and the bass player was a man named Bill Plummer who was a wonderful bass player, still is. He was interested in studying guitar, so they were, he would trade guitar lessons with my mom for I got bass lessons out of it, and he was the first person to talk to me about the uh, Lydian chromatic concept. And then and then a couple of years later, I, was, I found myself playing in a rock band with the stepson of the great Red Mitchell, and he used to give a bunch of us kids free lessons in a, in a grass music center in the Watts. Los Angeles. And when I was about 16, I was fortunate enough to take a master class at UCLA with Ray Brown. So, you know, when you see the that kind of gifts and that kind of work ethic and you see that at a young age, and uh, uh, it really, you know, it gives you a, a lift and an inspiration and uh and then, you know, from there I went to, I went to spend a year at Indiana University where I, uh, studied and performed with David Baker and, uh, and I spent, I lasted about a year there. Uh, just before going to there, I had met Bert Turetsky, who's a great, uh, contemporary music bassist and, uh, I immediately transferred to San Diego and through Bert, I ended up getting connected with, uh, the avant-garde jazz scene of Los Angeles. Uh, the, the then drummer and, and now mostly noted as a writer, Stanley Crouch, was leading a band called the Black Music Infinity that included Bobby Bradford, the great cornet player playing with Ornette, the uh, uh, great alto player uh, Arthur Blythe, who was made his reputation initially playing with the Horace Tapscott uh, ensemble in Los Angeles, and then it included a very my peers at the time. Uh, were uh, uh, the great flutist James Newton as well as David Murray on tenor. So it was really kind of a, you know, uh, a very, very committed and uh, ambitious group of folks. And, you know, David was the first one to move to New York and then James. And then I ended up going to New York for a couple of years and then, uh, came back for uh, a while and then ended up back in New York from 86 to 2004. But so that was... You know, that was really kind of a seminal music experience playing with that band. Uh, and it was because, well, musically, it was, it was inspiring that, you know, that the, the idea of the tradition was that you were to find your own sound and find your own music. That was sort of how I understood what jazz was about. 
And it wasn't like, even though I studied with Ray Brown and with and Brad Mitchell, it was, I, 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 I would, my, I was really more aimed towards experimentation and the influence of Bert, uh, as well. I'd been, it loomed big in my self image of what it meant to be a musician. So I'd just been sort of one foot after the other, continuing and figuring out, a, you know, I knew I desperately wanted to be a musician. I had no idea how it was going to work. Uh, uh, but somehow it did. I, I, in 83, I got a Fulbright to study in Italy with a great classical bass player named Franco Petrocchi. And from there, I started meeting a lot of wonderful musicians. And, and in 85, I got a call while I was in Rome to join the Anthony Braxton Quartet. And that, that was a really pivotal musical experience because that sort of, uh, well, it, it, it had me touring around the world. I mean, I had, I had played a little bit in Europe. I had toured a bit with uh, Ray Anderson, but it really wasn't until the Braxton gig that I really became came to, you know, uh, some kind of international attention and started being perceived differently. So that that was a huge boost uh, musically and spiritually and and uh, you know career wise as well. Well, and over the years, you played with a lot of people. You you even mentioned uh, uh, Jane Ira Bloom, you know Anthony Davis, uh, John Zorn, Jerry right. Hemingway. What have you learned from right. these kinds of cats that have been around for a while and had so much experience? What do you get from them, either by osmosis or directly? I mean, with the exception of Braxton, the rest of the musicians that you mentioned were are my peers, so we're the same age, more or less. And, you know, everyone is trying to throw down as hard as they can. And, and New York's a very, you know, I lived in New York for 18 years. It's a very competitive place. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's not competitive in like, you know, doggy dog way, but everyone is throwing down to put out their best musical imprint. And so you learn what it means to be professional. You learn what it means to, which means how to be prepared, how to, you know, follow what's, you know, you know, not only developing your own music, but preparing and finding your voice in someone else's music. So that's, you know, that, that was a really invaluable lesson, you know, and then that one, that's the one, that's the gift that keeps on giving, as they say. Absolutely. Without a doubt. You know, the one thing, too, over your career that's been pretty prolific in 2015 was a big year. You you win awards. In 2015, you got the Shifting Foundation Award, the Doris Duke Impact Award. I don't want to know what your favorite award is, but over the years, is there an award that you got that surprised you the most? Well, the Doris Duke was really came out of the blue. I mean, you know, you're you're nominated secretly and you're invited to – apply and then you're voted by your peers and and in a way that's the most meaningful because it's your peers that have uh you know recognized you and and just i just that feels so good you know it's like you know so much often in the musician for a musician you feel like you're working by yourself in the, in the boondocks and for the last 12 years you know i've been in san diego so like you know i've been I, I come to New York and perform a lot, but I've not been living there and and do and you know playing gigs every you know uh, monthly, you know. So I you know it's to, to get that award was a uh, uh, really it was, you know really felt great and it really helped me on on multiple levels. You know your your career has been pretty prolific. I keep throwing that word out, but you've been on over 130 CDs, various collaborations, solos. You have a DVD out. How do you feel about your career up to this point? When you when you really look back and and see what you've done and what you've accomplished, how do you feel? To be honest, I mean, I, I'm grateful for it all, but it's you know I'm trying to think about what's you know what, what's next, you know what's you know, what I'm trying to do now because I want I always want my best work to be ahead of me. And I you know and I, I want to be teaching from the point of being engaged in something, not working from memory, but involved in the creative process and that's something I want to take till I drop. So I'm grateful for it all and, and it's just you know, I feel very blessed to have been 
so fortunate to have been in sync with my times and with my peers and you know it's been, it's, it's been you know it's been great but you know I just I'm thinking about like what's the next CD can I come up with it what's you know what yeah. what is it that's going to you know propel me not career wise but artistically I'm always thinking I'm trying to figure out what artistically is going to give me the juice because if I can satisfy myself that way it usually works works out all the way around you know You've played with a lot of musicians. I'm sure you've seen a lot of shows in your life. Tell me this: what what do you what would be one of the dream shows if you could get into a time machine and go back and see? Who would you love to see live? Well, I would have loved to have seen you know the classic Coltrane Quartet. You know, I would have you know I yeah I, that that I, that I would have loved to feel that you know just uh, that rhythm section with Train you know. Uh, uh, you know, with uh, McCoy and Jimmy Garrison, I, that that's that's one for sure that uh, I would have loved to have been a part of, been been, been a part of as an audience. You know, I, I I've seen I've seen a lot of folks. I wish I'd seen uh, Duke more. I wish I had seen Louis Armstrong. I wish I'd seen him. Huh. You know, yeah. I just you know, because that 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 joyfulness and that spirit, boy, it, you know, it speaks out loud and clear on recordings, but I just can't even imagine how vivid that must have been live. Yeah. That, must, uh, that must have been really palpable. You know, it's interesting. I'm going to piggyback off of that notion, that thought. You know, jazz has obviously waned and waxed over the years, but when you look at the health and vitality of jazz in 2016, how healthy of an organism is jazz? I know a lot of folks who are throwing down hard and, and are giving, you know, creative music uh, jazz, what do you call jazz or between the cracks uh, uh, who are throwing down their strongest stuff and continue to do that. Uh, the, that's the part of the tradition that I, I really relish and, you know, I mean, everyone's trying to, you know, bring it to the next level and that, that part is really, really gratifying to be part of uh, a, a music that is so progressive and evolutionary. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the music business. I'm talking about you know, what's the developments that are happening in music. Well, let me get a little bit to the marrow of who you are. Why do you love jazz? Well, it's a music about personal expression. When I, I mean, a lot of people really inspire me, but of course, you know, but, you know, when I heard the expressivity and the, the, the fire of uh, Charles Mingus and the kind of way that dimensionally that he could interact with his times and as an artist, that really, you know, it gave me, I felt like I got the green light that, hey, maybe I could do this. Not maybe I could do it, but this is worthy of doing. That the, that music has that much potential, has that much potential. And, and you know, certainly in these times, now more than ever, we certainly need that kind of, you know, awareness and power in the music. You know, of all the CDs you've been on, all the live performances you've done, is there a fan compliment you got that you really remember, one of the nicest things a fan has ever said to you about your music? I don't know. I mean, I've had people come up after a solo concert and said they've never, you know, they've been moved and they've been touched and they felt that their life's been changed. Playing with the Braxton Quartet was really, really special. I have to say that was a pivotal musical experience just because the... His music and the way he would lead gave was the combination of maximal responsibility and maximal freedom combined. And he was really, you know, concerned about that you were all in, you know, all in with the music. And it wasn't about necessarily, it, it was really about, you know, how on how many levels can you throw down it and throwing down not just as a soloist, also, but as an ensemble, as a group, as an organism. You know, there are lots. Of, I mean, I love my uh, the you know this. I had this string trio for a long time called Arcado with Mark Feldman and Hank Roberts. That was very very special because it was uh, a, a unique orchestration and everyone was had different really different strengths and, and it just had a. Uh, a synergy that was very, very beautiful while it lasted. And uh, and then, you know, then there's a, yeah, 
And then, you know, the, I love also, you know, there's this wonderful pianist who's really been undersung named Denman Maroney, who's, uh, I've had so many groups with. He's been sort of central to most of my, my own groups since I started band leading. Uh, he was in, he's been in several versions of several different quintets. He's been, I've had duos with him. I've had a co-ops with him. He's, he's a member, of, currently a member of my trio and my East Coast quintet. Uh, he's really a special, unique uh, musician. I don't know if I—I I th- I think I diverted from your question about about reactions to the music, but uh, you know, I'm always surprised. I, I'm always surprised why people are moved by the music, and you know, when when I get comments, it's like it's people get it are experiencing the music very differently than I am. I'm all, I'm you know kind of in a place where I'm trying to, you know, do something. And so I'm, I'm more awfully in a self-critical mode. And when someone, thought, when I find someone's been really moved by something, I'm really grateful because I'm still struggling with it. <laughs> yeah, sure. So let me ask you this. I want to get, this is my final question for you, and I really want to kind of get to the essence of who you are. Everyone has a version of you, your family, your friends, those you play live for. But when you wake up and face the world, who do you think you are? Oh my God! You know, I, I'm a 63 year old white Jewish dude who's trying to do the best he can in music and try to, you know, uh, be a positive, uh, you know, struggling with, you know, life stuff and trying to do the best I can and make a contribution. That's all I want to do is try to make a contribution on some level. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm in a position now where I teach, so you know, you can uh, hopefully help the next generation find their space and in a place where I teach at UC San Diego, which really is guided towards contemporary music, you know, you find people, you know, we're talking about people trying to do things that, you know, this is really below the radar of the music industry as we know it. So they're, they're really trying to, you know, trying to do things. That's, that's a very difficult achievement. And, and any time I can help someone have the, good fortune that I have I feel like a good, that's a good day without a doubt that's a great way to kind of wrap everything up Mark thank you for opening up thank you for your time and thank you for oh, the sure. music I appreciate yeah, it yeah thank you I appreciate you playing it thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York Kansas City LA and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Mark for his time, his honesty, and his stories. And if you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. Or for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.